We call them robo craftsmen. In the morning, we make automotive parts. In the afternoon, we make aerospace parts. And nothing in the factory changes, just the software changes. The best analogy is what a potter does to a clay bowl. But we're applying that same analogy to a sheet of metal that requires a lot more force to be deformed. Machina is a company questioning the way we tackle one of the largest manufacturing processes in the world, metal sheet fabrication. Instead of stamping and molding metal sheets, two robots apply coordinated pressure to bend the metal. It's actually very quiet, but while I was standing next to these massive robots while filming, I could sort of sense the power behind them. Each of these cells are called a robo craftsman. A craftsman can pick up a tool, apply it to a material differently, and make all kinds of different parts and different types of processes because it has a creative mind. The same tool can be applied one day to turn a flat sheet into a shield. The next day you can apply it to a rod of material and turn that rod into a sword. This is what these robots do. Basically, through just software instruction, they can do different types of parts. There's two robots on both sides, very accurately applying a lot of force, sometimes as high as a weight of a truck, well, sometimes 20,000 newtons to deform a sheet into shape. 20,000 newtons around 5,000 pounds. While filming, I wondered what inspired Ed to get all the money and people together to build and develop this new kind of fabrication system. When I was at SpaceX, I found this very challenging issue we had, which was every time you have to manufacture a part, a physical part, you pretty much have to build a factory for it. There's a lot of tooling, a lot of machinery that goes into the factory that are very specific to the type of parts you manufacture or the type of geometry is the type of material you're manufacturing. I got really excited about 3D printing because 3D printing had this promise of you can change your design, you can change your geometry without having to change your factory. But while I was there, I realized that there's a whole lot of other types of parts that we have to manufacture that 3D printing cannot do. It was not within the reach of 3D printing. So we started Machina to kind of create that overarching automation that allows us to form different types of parts, different types of processes, different types of geometries without having to change the factory. I think every successful IT team I've worked at, either be it at Microsoft and Google or at SpaceX, was all about, there's lots of unknown unknowns, iterate, build product fast, put it in the hand of your customers. And it, the shorter you can make that cycle, the more likely you have a successful product. The sheet metal forming is the largest metal processing sector out of all. It's a $280 billion industry, right? So most of the parts you see day to day are sheet metal parts. From when you're sitting in a car in a freeway, you're like in a sea of sheet metal form, sheet metal parts. You're sitting in an aircraft, it's like a sheet metal can. Same thing with rocket exteriors, right? So the biggest metal processing sector, but today doesn't have a very agile way to make these parts. If you want to form these parts, you have to go create dyes and molds and stamp it, which requires hundreds of thousands of dollars investment per part and 50, sometimes 50 weeks of lead time before you get your first batch of parts. The, the initial kind of format of the process is called incremental forming because you're incrementally forming a sheet into shape. Academics have been working on this, I would say since like 70s, 80s, um, but they couldn't never really unlock it in a commercial sense um, because you could never form a very accurate part with it. And also the cost of the system was very high. So what we are doing now is bringing both the cost of the system down with the robotics, but more importantly, we're trying to make this process accurate to a point where it's actually used in commercial applications. And the way we do that is through empirical modeling. That's where machine learning piece comes into play. We're actually gathering data to figure out how do we need to instruct these robots in the right way. So at the end of the process, the part is within tolerance. It's sub-millimeter accuracy on a part that might be five foot by 12 foot. The traditional academic research you know, could not get to that level of accuracy. So we're using this artificial intelligence piece and the robotic piece to finally make this process commercialized. Machina now looks like they've got a solid plan and a ton of customers, which they do. But hearing about their early scrappier days is one of my favorite examples of early startup grit to date. This is the first cell that we put together. At the time, we didn't have a lot of money, so we couldn't buy the actual new robots. Um, and also the lead time would just not work for a startup because it's like six or seven months of lead time and a runway was, well, you know, maybe like twice that. So we ended up buying used robots from Mercedes. But they still work properly, right? You have the full stack of the stuff that we need on the robot head. There was a whole lot of challenges back then, right? You know, we still didn't have the, enough data to build models. Uh, robotic piece was still not as accurate as we wanted it. So there's a lot of human intervention early on sitting by the cell, sleeping next to it and controlling it manually until we formed the right part. 
and then slowly and incrementally constantly iterating on the cell and developing the next version. Like one of our main strategies of development was like, get to test things as soon as possible. So we like very early on, we made a lot of choices in terms of like really do stuff in a hacky way so that we can get to results. Initially looked at this machine was like, it was magical for us. I could form anything. Now it's like, I think to some extent it's trivialized for us. We're like, oh, it just forms parts. It was good to see that there was a day when I look at some of the pictures of the parts that this machine made in early days, we had to make like 25, 30 trials to even get the part to the rough shape that was correct. Now we're like doing it in like four or five trials. I think even in our current facility, uh, we have seven or eight different versions of the software running on different types of cells. Um, we really run this operation similar to how we develop software as opposed to develop hardware. Really fast iteration, rapid changes, but very much also customer driven. So we can kind of incrementally provide value for the customer. Our main business is building the machines, right? Um, so you can actually see one of the more machines here. This is our version three. This is what we sell. So a lot of our customers come to us to initially do a proof of concept, develop a part, but eventually they, made, they, um, they purchase a cell and we ship it to their facility. So our biggest application today is for Department of Defense, repairing and sustaining aircrafts. Like we have like 50, 60 different aircraft platforms. And some of them are 70, 80 years old. And every time a part gets damaged on those things, the DOD has a very hard time replacing those parts because they have to go find a vendor, create tooling for that part, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes four or five years of lead time before an aircraft can get repaired. So during that time, the aircraft is underground. This version, which is our version three, can be deployed on the back of a truck. And the reason actually we went with a deployable version was a requirement that we received from Department of Defense around, can you allow us to deploy these closer to the conflict? Because if you can take logistics out of manufacturing of parts for defense systems, that's a huge deal. So there's a lot of focus on distributed manufacturing, even close to the theater, to the front lines of battle. So this version can go on the back of a truck. The next version we're working on, it's gonna be a container that kind of folds in and kind of like a butterfly opens up and within the same day become productionized and start making parts. Yeah, so this one is actually about to form a part that uh, we're doing for NASA right now. It's gonna be a component of a toroidal tank. This is actually an interesting part because back in the 50s and 60s, they used to use these skilled craftspeople, sheet shapers, that would use hammers and bump forming to form them into shape and then weld these pieces together to form a tank that looks like a donut that you could use for the lunar lander. But then those people kind of passed away or they retired, so we don't have that skill anymore. So with our technology, we're bringing that back so we can actually form those turtle tanks the same way craftsmen would form it, but using robots. Most of the parts that we do are pretty large. From parts, like I said, we're doing for a tank and space tank that we're working with NASA to a car door. This is actually like an application that I'm super excited about. Um, you know, it finally gives us an ability to be very expressive with our cars. Because right now the main challenge with automotive is that every time you want to have a profitable car, you basically have to have a car that everybody buys the same thing over and over again. Because if you want to have a factory that doesn't change, manufactures the same thing. So you can pay for that factory. Uh, so the more of the same car people buy, the more likely it is that that factory is profitable. And that's a limitation of technology. The reason that exists is because the factories cannot change. So what we are bringing uh, with this technology back to the automotive industry is being able to almost do custom to order cars. You can go on a website, potentially design your own door, and then have that car delivered to you that is very specific to you. So that's, that's something that I'm personally very excited about and uh, we're enabling using our technology. In manufacturing, a lot of times the same part needs to go through multiple processes. What we're trying to do is the same robotic cell can do all of those pieces. So we started from sheet forming, but a robotic system doesn't stop there, right? So the same robot can do trimming, can do scanning, and we're constantly adding more operations. We're working with our, some of our customers uh, to add bending, hemming, surface finishing. The robot just basically drops the forming end effector, picks up another tool, and does another, another boss. This is a tool changing table. So you're saying how this goes from forming to some other process. It comes back, drop the old tool, pick up another tool, and does the other process. We're working right now with the Department of uh, Defense on adding key treatment capability to our robotic cell. In addition to forming and trimming, can we actually change the temper by applying heat to it? So that's one of the, one of the major milestones that we're, we're working on in the next few months. 
The holy grail of manufacturing are general manufacturing abilities, where you don't have to change much in the setup of your production process to get wildly different parts. Machina's incremental forming for metal sheet fabrication is a huge step in that direction, and as they scale up their technology, their robo-craftsmen could deliver more abundance and value to the world.